Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons has been on the book of Ephesians, that short book in the New Testament with only six chapters. We've had 14 lessons, and now this is lesson number 14 in that series for September 30 of 2023. And this particular lesson is entitled Ephesians in the Heart. Hmm. So we're going to sort of take a, a bird's eye view, or maybe I should say a drone view these days, of the message of Ephesians. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we turn to summarize what great messages there are in this book of Ephesians, help us to see clearly why they're important and how they fit with everything else we know about you. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As we finish this series on the book of Ephesians, tell it, let us review what we have studied. Jim? From the Bible study guide, visitors to London climb on board the London Eye, a Ferris wheel-like attraction. From 450 feet above the River Thames, you can see it all. Big Ben, the House of Parliament, and the many historic palaces and cathedrals. For a New Testament scholar, Thomas, excuse me, Nicholas Thomas Tom Wright, the letter to the Ephesians stands in relationship to the rest of Paul's letters, rather like the London Eye, a breathtaking view of the entire landscape. From here, as the wheel turns, you can see, excuse me, you get a bird's eye view of the one th theme after another. Paul, for everyone, the prison letters of... So, um... We'll see, what do we see? What are the themes that he's gonna tell us about? In Ephesians, Paul is not focused on issues of local concern. The letter reads as though Paul were addressing believers everywhere in Christian churches, wherever they exist. And in fact, that was the case. It was written to the church at Ephesus because they were the ones who copied, made copies and sent them on to the other churches. But the letter was intended for the benefit of all the churches in that part of the world at that point in time. The letter's timeless feel allows the breathtaking view Paul offers to invade our own world and thought. As we review each chapter, let's keep this question in mind. What important truths embedded in Ephesians should continue to shape our lives as believers? From our Bible study guide for Sabbath afternoon. Ephesians is one of the key books in our understanding of the great controversy over the character and government of God. At the very beginning of this book, which was written from prison to the church members in Western Asia Minor or modern Turkey, Paul rises to new heights and insight. New heights of insight, I'm sorry. Jim? Or I'm sorry, that should be Carrie. Carrie, yes. yes. Ephesians 1, 8 through 10. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth, with Christ as head. Once again, the point is, when we talk about the great controversy, how many people are involved, how, many, how much is involved? The, whole universe. the entire universe. Yes. If your message is for one group of people or even all human beings, it's still too small. Colossians, a parallel book written at the same time and sent also to Ephesus and then on to Colossians, to Colossae. Um, written at the same time, gives us additional insight. Colossians Jennifer? 1, chapters 19 to 20. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his Son's blood. Footnote, his Son's blood or his Son's sacrificial death on the cross, and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven, in the Good News Bible. Okay, so one of the challenges I want you to think about there as you listen to this, how does the death of Christ bring the whole universe 
back to God. Is that possible? There's truth. Remember Jesus. Okay. Ellen White puts it in these words, through the plan of salvation, a larger purpose is to be wrought out even than the salvation of man and the redemption of the earth. Bigger than this world, in other words. Through the revelation of the character of God in Christ, the beneficence of the divine government would be manifested before the universe. The charge of Satan refuted, the nature and result of sin made plain, and the perpetuity of the law fully demonstrated. So if you could see that those things, those key issues, just spread out for you as clear, plain and clear as possible on a page, wouldn't that, shouldn't that impact you in some way? Yeah, wow. I think so. And that was uh, written, first of all, in Signs of the Times, uh, one of our fa famous news uh, journals, February 13, 1893, and then copied in a number of other places. Mm -hmm. Going on, um, but the plan, oh, Jim, I'm going to let you read you the next one there. Okay, but the plan of salvation, excuse yeah. me, the plan of redemption had yet a broader, deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe, to the to this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of the other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before the, his crucifixion he said, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all unto me, John 12, 31 I'm and 32. interrupt there, as you know. We've got to talk about this. In the King James, it says, we'll draw what? All, and then italics the word men, if it's, it's a proper printing. Yeah. Okay, so... I might, I might mention a bit, the word men is not in there. It's, it's not in the Greek. Years not ago, in, when I was at, uh, at the Princeton Theological uh, Seminary, with, and Dr. Bruce Metzger, the general editor of the, uh, um, King, or the RSV, he picked that verse as an example of how translators work. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when, mm -hmm. when he got done doing his, his spiel, he, they, 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 they put words in. And I raised my hand at the back of the room and I says, you think maybe he would have been better if he'd have left that word uh, men out? Because then it would have been more in keeping with Paul said in Colossians 1, 19 and 20 and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Went over like a lead, lead balloon because people didn't understand the great controversy, yeah. you see? Yeah, you can talk of stuff right out of the book. In fact, that's one of the problems with Bible translations. Uh, we, with the Bible translation, they, they, they read it into their theological spectacles. It's impossible not, I mean, every one of that's us speak out from what we, what we know and what we, what we, what we can understand. We, that's what happens, and so we have to take advantage we, that's we need that's to, a key uh, t a text. The, the Good News translation on that one, uh, uh, 1232, yeah. um, everyone, they use the word everyone, yeah. which is, a, you can make the case that that's not so bad. Well, but and Ellen White clearly understood oh, because she had, she's, uh, she's talking about the whole universe all through here. Right. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the Act okay. of Christ. Where, bottom, where are we at? Oh, yeah. The act of Christ in, in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and result of sin. From Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68 and 69. Okay. So if you want to know the results of sin, just watch what Satan did to Christ. Hmm. Okay. Carrie. Yes. Uh, okay. Ellen White. Okay. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. Not alone. Hold on just a second. I want you to think of the implications of that statement. 
He came from where? He came from heaven. And who was he living with? Angels. All the angels. He comes down here to reveal God to men and to angels? Okay. What, what, what's wrong with this picture? Okay, go ahead and read. All right. Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. Not alone for this earthborn children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look. And this is via 1 Peter 1.12. And it will be their study throughout endless ages. And this is from Mrs. White, The Desire of Ages, okay. 1998. Okay. So who's going to be studying the plan of salvation and its effects and this life of Christ on this earth throughout endless ages? All intelligence creatures. Angels desire to look. Yeah. We all, really, yeah, all intelligent creatures, the whole universe is going to be thinking about what Christ did and the whole plan of salvation from beginning to end for the rest of eternity. Jennifer. From Ellen G. White. To the angels and the unfallen worlds, the cry. To the angels and the unfallen worlds, the cry, it is finished, had a deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen worlds. The archipostate had so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion from the desire of ages. And we're back to the word redemption. I think El, in the book Education, Ellen White says, Redu redemption is education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's and education is not making some pronouncement and everybody just falls in line. No, it has, you have to process the data. So think for a moment about Satan's predicament as when, when Jesus came to this earth, Satan, I'm sure, turned to all his cronies and said, Nobody has lived on this earth yet without sinning. We are going to get this baby to sin. Okay? When he failed that, well, life goes all the way through his life and he's into his ministry and he's approaching the end of his ministry and he still hasn't got him to sin. He says, okay, we may not be able to get him to sin, but let's make things so difficult for him that he just gives up on people and he goes back to heaven. And then he'll leave this world to us. He failed with that one. So finally, when Jesus was already dead and he's in the tomb, the angels, every single one of Satan's angels was there to try and to keep that grave shut because they knew that if Jesus rose out of that grave and came out, it was curtains for them. That would mean the, not right at that moment, but the time was, come, was going to come when it's going to be all over for them. So Satan and his angels were in a, what, what, what we call the ultimate catch-22. If you try to stand back and pretend like you're a nice guy, Satan's going to, I mean, Christ is going to succeed anyway. If you do everything you possibly can to destroy Christ or to figure out, to prevent him from doing his work, etc., then you maybe have a chance of doing something, but you're going to reveal your, your ambitions and your methods to the entire universe. And that's exactly what happened. They saw what, Jesus, what Satan, you know, they thought, this person who used to be the head of the angels, look what he's doing. Already in Ephesians 1, Paul suggested that the scene covers the full span of salvation history from eternity past through God's grace-filled actions in Christ to eternity future. Can you think of another place in Scripture where the great controversy is covered from beginning to end? Revelation 12 through 14, right there. As Paul takes on this panoramic view of history <clears throat> and salvation, he broke into praise. I mean, here he is, he's in prison, uh, was suffering all this kind of stuff and abuse and worried, worried every morning he wakes up whether he's gonna, his head is going to be cut off, and he's breaking into praise. Okay, whose turn is that one? Is that mine? No. Ephesians 1, 15 to 19. For this reason, 
because I understand the, this whole issue of the great controversy and who all is involved, ever since I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks to God for you. I remember you in my prayers and ask the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, to give you the Spirit who will make you wise and reveal God to you so that you will know Him. I ask that your minds may be open to see His light so that you will know what is, this, what is the hope to which He has called you, how rich are the wonderful blessings He promises His people, and how very great is His power at work in us who believe. This power working in us is the same as the mighty strength which He used when He raised Christ from death and seated Him at His right side in the heavenly world. So what's Paul saying? I'm not, I'm not talking about, I'm not blowing clouds of smoke here. I'm talking about something that's already been proven. Here's one who came to this earth. He died. He was raised. He's back in heaven. He's sitting at the right-hand side of God. This is, this is real stuff. So, how has the life and death of Jesus affected your life? How could the life and death of someone who'd lived 2,000 years ago affect our lives in the 21st century? Can other people see that we are Christians? Has your understanding of the great controversy affected your lives? If so, why? How did you feel about being chosen by God from before this world was created? That's what Ephesians says. What was God's original plan for the human race? We all should be living in an expanded version of the Garden of Eden. That's where we're supposed to be. What percentage of the seven billion people living on this earth have any idea about the Great Controversy and its implications? 0.0000% right? How should it affect us to realize that we can be adapt, adopted into the universe-wide family of God to live forever around the throne of God? Okay, let's look at some of those verses. Ephesians 1.10, Jim? This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring a creation together, bring all creation, all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth with Christ as his head. Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 4. In the past you were spiritually dead because of your disobedience and sins. At this time you, excuse me, at this time you followed the world. At that time. The, I'm sorry, man, my eyes here. At that time, you followed the world's evil way. You obeyed the ruler of the spiritual powers in space, the spirit who now controls the people who disobey God. Actually, all of us were like them and lived according to all our natural desires, doing whatever suited the wishes of our own bodies and minds. In our natural condition, we, like everyone else, were destined to suffer God's anger. But God's mercy is so abundant and His love for us so great. And then Ephesians. I, yeah, good, new, good news Bible there. I want you to think about what Paul is saying there. He's saying, you people, uh, we've talked about all the crazy stuff that was going on in the, in, the, in the temple of Artemis there in Ephesians and how evil that all was. And Paul is saying, I grew up as a Pharisee, but I, my situation was just as bad as yours. Now, mm. we were think destined about to suffer God's anger. I think we need to explain that yep. word anger because God, God's anger is his, uh, from the Greek word. Uh, oh, Paradidomy. Uh, no. Uh, Which one? Uh, orge. Yeah. And which is, but he's, he gives you freedom. Yeah. That's what, what ultimately he doesn't interfere in your desi desire to grow uh, to, down the wrong path. Yeah. That's his, uh, this unfortunately dis, uh, described as God's anger, and that isn't a, really the, a good description. People don't understand it, yeah. Well, let's explain it to them from time to time. Yeah. Carrie? Yeah. Uh, Ephesians 2, there, 8 and 9. For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. And that's from the Good News Bible. And there's a very simple way to explain that. 
we, we sometimes say, well, what, is God doing some kind of magic? No, just think about if, if God didn't care about us, he would have just left us. We would perish. So, you know, that would be it. There, would, there was absolutely nothing. If God did, chose not to do something for us, there's absolutely nothing we could do about it. It's not God's character. Well, no, I'm not, I'm not arguing <laughs> no, with that. We've got to make sure that at the end we explain it. Yeah. God does everything in, to educate us. It's everything possible to save us and to, to heal us and to educate us. Okay. Jennifer, do you want to try Ephesians 2, 11 and 12 there? Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 12. You Gentiles by birth, called, quote, the uncircumcised by the Jews, who call themselves, quote, the circumcised, which refers to what men do to their bodies. Remember what you were in the past. At that time, you were apart from Christ. You were foreigners and did not belong to God's chosen people. You had no part in the covenants, which were based on God's promises to his people, and you lived in this world without hope and without God, from the Good News Bible. Wow. And John understood that, John 1, 13. They did not become God's children by natural means, that is, by being born as the children of a human father. God himself was their father. And our Bible study guide goes on to say, it turns out we were wrong about God in all these aspects. When God opened his mysteries before Paul, Paul was shocked. For this reason, although the end, entire uh, epistle is describing this mystery from different perspectives, the apostle returns in the center of the epistle to calling it the mystery, Ephesians 3, 3 and 9, and the mystery of Christ, Ephesians 3, 4, and at the end of his letter, the mystery of the gospel, Ephesians 6, 19, from the New American Standard Bible. This mystery is all the more valuable. And I should stop for a second and tell you, the word musterion in, in Greek means not something that nobody can figure out. It means something that you understand, mean, that you understand once, once it's been un explained to you. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. It's like a secret. If I tell you the secret, you know it. So this mystery is not an impossible thing to know. It's something you can know if you know, if you've been instructed. Like Jim keeps talking you about the education. You could be persuaded, but the process ultimately ends in persuasion rather than just convince. Because yeah. once you can become persuaded of something, it come hell or high water, you're, you're, you're still committed to the Hopefully. force of, of truth. <laughs> well, if you become persuaded. Yeah. Now just have faith. You know, faith is believing something you, do, you know ain't so, or it doesn't There's make some sense. some people. Uh, Tertullian and so forth. So this mystery is all the more valuable, Paul explains, when we realize that it was hidden from the people in the past centuries and millennia. And God chose Paul's generation to live in that unique historical time when that mystery of mysteries was fully revealed for all to see. So it's still a mystery even though it's been revealed because what? To those who, do, who have, don't understand it, it's a complete mystery. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like you're talking a different, uh, different language, yeah. it's a, a different culture. In Ephesians 2, Paul recognized that we were once sinners, controlled by our natural desires, doing whatever we felt like doing. In that condition, God could not save us to live in a perfect universe. We just, I mean, it, it would be, you know, we'd stick out like a sore thumb. Paul went on, to, on saying that God has brought together people from all parts of the world. He has brought down, I'm sorry, he has broken down the wall that separated us and kept us enemies. We have the opportunity to become fellow citizens with God's universe-wide family. We are even described as building blocks in the temple of which Christ is the chief cornerstone. Okay, where are we now? It's probably my turn. Okay. Uh, but God, those two words must be the most hopeful ones known to humankind. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, Paul describes the grim past of his audience, sharing the plight of all humanity. They were bent toward rebellion against God, their lives dominated by sin and Satan. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. But God, who is rich in mercy, and what did God do for them and for us? One, he made us alive with Christ. Christ's resurrection is our own. 
Okay, I'm going to interrupt there for again. Paul's message, and I, I understand this more clearly from the book of, of Ephesians than I ever have before. It must, I must have seen it sometime in the past, but the point is, he's saying here, look, Christ was a human being. Jesus, you know, Jesus Christ was a human being. Jesus was his human name, Christ was his divine name. But he died, he was buried, he rose to life by his own power. He went back to heaven. He seated at the right hand throne of God. So don't tell me it's not possible. Here's, here's he it did it. God did it. It's there. It's it, he, so it's possible for us. Okay, go ahead. He made us alive with Christ. Christ's resurrection is our own. Yep. Two, he raised us up with Christ. Christ's ascension is our own. Three, in heaven he seated us with Christ. Christ's coronation is our own, Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. We are not just bystanders to the cosmos shifting events of Christ's life. God takes these remarkable actions, not because of any merit in us, but because of his grace, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And he intends believers to live in solidarity with Jesus and practice Good Works, Ephesians 2.10. From our Bible study guide for Monday, September 25. So now let's be, let's be clear. Could we actually be a part of God's remarkable actions, the world transforming events, beginning with the life of Christ and leading to eternal salvation? Could we be? Yeah. Jennifer? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 9. For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. God has made us what we are, and in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds, which he has already prepared for us to do. The Good News Bible. So Paul is saying, Jesus did it, it's possible for us to do it. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 has played a role in the conversion of many. Martin Luther found in these verses a grace that won his heart, and he discovered as well some central affirma affirmations of the Reformation. Salvation comes by faith alone, through grace alone, by Christ alone, and to the glory of God alone. In 1738, 18 days after experiencing conversion in London's Aldergate, Aldersgate Street, John Wesley preached at Oxford, Oxford University offering, quote, a cry from the heart and, quote, the manifesto of a new movement. His text, mm. Ephesians 2.8. Mm. And you can read about it in this book by, uh, in t about stra strangely warned, warmed, I'm sorry, the Wesleyans and the Evangelical Awakening. How did your conversion, how did your conversion affect you and me? How much did your life change? In Ephesians 3, Paul focused on the secret mystery that has now been revealed about God's blessings and how we can become members of the same body which Jesus Christ established. So, and what do we know about that body? Jim? Ephesians chapter 3, verses 7 to 10. I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift, which he gave me through the working of his power. I am less in the least, I mean, less than the least of all God's people, yet God gave me the privilege of taking the, to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ. I'm going to interrupt you again for a second. Here's a Pharisee who, the first part of his, I don't know, a third of his life or half his life, did absolutely not want to have anything to do with Gentiles at all. Yeah. I mean, isn't that true? That's, yeah. Pharisee of the Pharisee? Of that. Yeah. Oh, look, what he's, look what he's excited about now. Spreading the gospel to Gentiles. Okay, go ahead. And the making of all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn, learn of his wisdom in all its different forms from the Good News Bible. And whenever I read that sentence, I think, okay, the angels are standing around 
the throne of God. What could they possibly learn about God from us way over here in this little marble off in space somewhere? That's why the this story we uh, Genesis one is is the, is there because the Elohim were around we, ones we call angels now mm -hmm. were around and they had to have some more teaching. Yeah. And the ultimate demonstration was Colossians 1, 19 and 20 and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. It wasn't when the fullness of time yeah. with it, that Jesus' death brought peace to the beings in the heavenly places. It answered their questions that they had. Yeah. In Ephesians 3, Paul tried to summarize God's mysterious plan as outlined in the Bible study guide and these points. Carrie, I think it's your turn. Yeah. In eternity, God conceives of the mystery or the plan about the church. So God had this idea before any of us were created, okay? Yes, that's Ephesians 3, 3 through 5 and 9, 11. Through the life and death of Jesus, that long hidden plan is accomplished, Ephesians 3, 11, New King James Version. And uh, God, God, yeah. Suggest comparing, uh, Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. So God said, it is possible for a human being to live on this earth all the way through his life without sinning. Satan said, no, he can't. Oh yeah, watch me. Well, he was also hang, trying to hang on, remember the, in Revelation 12, 4, mm -hmm. the tail of the dragon swept down a third of the stars, the mm -hmm. heavenly intelligences yep. to, to this earth. And he wants to hang on to the other two thirds because they'd heard the lies and de deceptions and extortions mm -hmm. and distortions. And uh, this is a whole e education. Okay. Everything's education. Next one, Carrie. Uh, through the life and death of Jesus, that long hidden plan is accomplished. Uh, Ephesians 3.11. Okay. Carrie, Ephesians 2.11 through 22. By revelation, Paul learns the mystery of the church and the astonishing fact that Gentiles are to be full partners in it. Ephesians 3, 3 through 6. Paul participates in spreading this good news as preacher to the Gentiles of the unsearchable rather, riches of Christ. Ephesians 3, 8. With many one to Christ, the church composed as it is of both Jews and Gentiles displays the manifold wisdom God to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Ephesians 3.10, announcing their coming doom. Compare uh, Ephesians 6.10 through 20. The plan to unite all things in Christ, Ephesians 1.10, is underway and their time is short. It's from the Adult Sabbath School Study Guide for Tuesday, September 26. To us, it might seem like it's been forever since the days of Adam and Eve, but to God, it's the blink of an eye. And he says, just give me enough time. I'm, I'm, I'm working things out. You will see. Okay, Jennifer. From Ellen G. White. The prince of this world cometh, said Jesus, and hath nothing in me, John 14:30. There was in him nothing that responded to Satan's sophistry. He did not consent to sin, not even by a thought did he yield to temptation. So it may be with us, Christ's humanity was united with divinity. He was fitted for the conflict by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he came to make us partakers of the divine nature. Okay, I want you to think about that. What does it mean to be partakers of the divine nature? Wow. Well, you're not going to be self-centered if you're... If you're <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, and that, and with, if, if nobody is self-centered, then you don't you're need courts. You don't, you don't have, need courts. You don't need law codes. You don't need uh, committees. You don't need uh, bo uh, books and records to keep track of people because nobody's self-centered. Yeah. If you're not... Huh? I think it's also having emotional intelligence where it's like not getting angry and having humility and patience. That's all part of education. It's, yeah. There's no quick you know, snap your fingers and, and uh, hunk, you know, or somebody comes well, into you and puts a steering wheel in. No, it's a free dis decision making on your part. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
So long as we are united to him by faith, sin has no more dominion over us. God reaches for the hand of faith in us to direct it, to lay fast hold upon the divinity of Christ, that we may attain to perfection of character. And how this is accomplished, Christ has shown us. By what means did he overcome in the conflict with Satan? By the word of God. Only by the word could he resist temptation. Quote, it is written, he said, and unto us are given, quote, exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. There it is again. Mm -hmm. Having escaped the corruption that is in us, that is in the world through lust, from 2 Peter 1, 4. Every promise in God's word is ours. By every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God are we to live. With, when assailed by temptation, look not to circumstances or to the weakness of self, but to the power of the word. All its strength is yours. Thy word, says the psalmist, have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. By the word of thy lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. Psalm 119, verse 11 and 17, 4 from the Desire of Ages. Quoting um, page 123, verses three, I mean, paragraph three and four. So how has the life and death of Jesus affected the rest of the universe? That which alone can effectually restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. Does that say past tense or current tense or future tense? Will prevent sin in heaven. Sounds like it's future. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. You see what sin does, you see its results, and if your mind isn't all messed up, you realize that's not the way to go. It is through, through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. The plan of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an eternal safeguard. How long is eternal? Forever. Ever, yes. Forever. Yep, an eternal safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who, are, who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb from Signs of Times, December 30, 1889, from the Bible Commentary, Volume 5, 1132. I like to describe it like this. How does this become an eternal safeguard? God has a panoramic view, a panorama. We're going to see it at the third coming and maybe before that up in heaven. But I mean, it's going to make Steven Spielberg turn green. It's going to be, you know, 3D living color. This is the great kind of spread out before you. And if in the future, someone who was created later, maybe God goes on creating people probably, or some not necessarily like us, maybe some other kind. But if one of them decides to rebel, God will say, sit down there. I want you to see what happened the last time somebody tried this. And if that person still decides they want to rebel, he will call all of us who've been through the, this experience of Earth, gather around, okay, what do you think should happen to this person that wants to rebel? Do we want to do the great controversy all over again? No. So all God has to do is just step back and nobody will question his behavior at all, like they would have at the beginning when they didn't understand. Having seen the great controversy, no, we're never going to do that again. The plan of salvation making manifest the justice love of God provides an eternal safeguard. That's what we're talking about. Why did the angels need the message of the cross? Jim? If a male white, for centuries, God looked with patience and forbearance upon the cruel treatment given to, the, to his ambassadors at his holy law at his holy law, prostrate, despised, trampled underfoot. He swept away the inhabitants of the Noachian world with a flood, but when the earth was again peopled, men th 
drew away from God and renewed their hostility to him, manifesting bold defiance. Those whom God rescued from Egyptian bondage followed in the footsteps of those who had preceded them, caused them... Caused what? Because, excuse me, cause was followed by effect and earth was being corrupted. A crisis had arrived in the government of God. All Hold on, wait a minute. The government of God? Where's that? That's in heaven. Yeah. A crisis had arrived in heaven? Uh, that's, what, well, Revelation 12, 7. Keep reading. All heaven was prepared at the word of God to move to help, excuse me, move the help of his elect. One word from him and the bolts of heaven would have fallen upon the earth, filling it with fire and f flame. God had but to speak and there would have been thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes and destruction. The heavenly intelligences were prepared for a fearful manifestation of almighty power. Every move was watched with intense anxiety. The exercise of justice was expected. The angels looked at to God, so look for God to punish the inhabitants of the earth. Okay, I'm going to halt for just a second. They said, God, you cleaned up the world once by a flood. What are you going to do now? You have to look at what's going on down there. You've got to do it. Okay? The heavenly universe was amazed at God's patience and love to save Holland, fallen humanity that God, excuse me, the Son of God took humanity upon himself from the Ellen White from Patriarchs, excuse me, from Review and Herald, July 17, 1900. That's over 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. and also in Desire of Ages, page 37. Compare it. For centuries, God bore with the inhabitants of the old world, but at last, guilt reached its limit. He came to the place of punishment. He came, out. Me, okay. came out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth and by flood cleanse the earth of its iniquity. Notwithstanding this terrible lesson, men had no sooner begun to multiply once more than rebellion and vice became widespread. Satan seemed to have taken control of the world. The time came that a change must be made or the image of God would be wholly obliterated from the hearts of the beings he had created. All heaven watched the movements of God with intense interest. Would he once more manifest his wrath? Would he destroy the world by fire? The angels thought that the time had come to strike the blow of justice, when, lo, in their wondering to vision, them. in well, oh, to, to their them. wondering vision, was unveiled the plan of salvation. Ellen White, manuscript page two, uh, manuscripts 22, January 10, 1890, from the Ellen White Diary of the 1888 materials. And why isn't this information spread all over the place? Why you can't even get it in, in the Adventist Church. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is, a, I mean, the angels in heaven, they thought that these rebels, God, why do you tolerate this bunch of rebels? Just get rid of them and start over again. Okay? It is, is it possible that Paul's prayer, as well as the prayer of Jesus Christ, recorded in John 17, could apply to us as individuals and as a church in our day? What barriers still separate Christians from each other? How can those barriers be broken down? In Ephesians 4, Paul talked about what needed or needs to happen to transform the church. By the way, those paragraphs that we read there from Mellon White, they weren't in the Bible study guide. Those were added. I'm, I'm not, not, not a shock to no, figure that, see that one. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that needed to be in there, but it's not. In Ephesians 4, Paul talked about what needed or needs to happen to transform the church. Okay, Carrie? Uh, Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. I urge you then, I who am a prisoner because I serve the Lord, live a life that measures up to the standard God set when he called you. Be always humble, gentle, and patient. Show your love by being tolerant with one another. Do your best to preserve the unity which the Spirit gives by means of the peace that binds you together. 
There is one body and one spirit, just as there is one hope to which God has called you. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is one God and Father of all, who is Lord of all, works through all, and is in all. From the Good News Bible. Wow. One, 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 one. Yeah. There's not half a dozen ways to get to God. There's one. After God has gone to incredible lengths to make this plan of salvation work, this is what can happen. Jennifer? From Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. And so we shall all come together, all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be children, carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ, who is the head. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together, and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So, when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love, from the Good News yep. Bible. Paul was aware of the evils that pervaded Ephesus and the surrounding cities and communities. It was time for the Christian churches to stand out as beacons of light. God's plan to make us all one is wonderful and certain to eventually take place. Is there any chance that this plan won't work? We know it's going to work. Yeah. It's it absolutely, there's no question about it. However, it will involve much work because between now and then. Every member of the church is supposed to be gifted and use that gift to prepare others for life eternal. Are we doing that? As Paul prepared to conclude this marvelous book, he stated in Ephesians 5, the first five verses, since you are God's dear children, you must try to be like him. Your life must be controlled by love, just as Christ beloved us and gave his life for us as a sweet smelling offering and sacrifice that pleases God. Since you are God's people, it is not right that any matters of sexual immorality or indecency or greed should ever be mentioned among you. And he was thinking, I'm sure, about what was going on in the temple at Artemis there. Nor is it fitting for you to use language which is obscene, profane, or vulgar. Rather, you should give thanks to God. You may be sure that no one who is immoral, indecent, or greedy, for greed is a form of idolatry, will ever receive a share in the kingdom of Christ and of God. From the Good News Bible again. Jim? Well, the Bible study guide. If you start reading Ephesians 5 at, the be excuse me, at its beginning, you may miss the full power of an important theme. So, start instead with Ephesians 4, 32. In which, which is, of course, the last verse of Ephesians 4. Right. In which Paul tells the Ephesians to, quotes, be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. From the New King James Version, from the Bible Study Guide for September 28. As Paul discussed the Christian effects on marriage, parenting, and human slavery, we recognize that there should be a total transformation of society. And today, we, we hear different groups with their different sides say, well, if things could just go this way, well, that would solve all our problems. And somebody else says, or if things will go just the opposite, it would solve all our problems. No, the only solution to the problem is a total transformation of society. And that's what happens when you go to heaven. It's on, only the people who are committed to living a life of peace and love. That, that's, that's the way it works. That's the way it happens. It's not going to happen any other way. Bible study guide. I think, Carrie, I think it's you. Yes. Paul extends his theme of imitating God's love as he advises Christian husbands and wives. Christ's self-sacrificing love for the church becomes a model for Christian husbands as in Ephesians 5, 25 through 33. 
while the lo loyalty rather of the church toward Christ becomes a model for Christian wives, Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, uh, becomes the model for Christian wives. Rather than using the gift of human sexuality in a debauched and selfish way, a Christian husband and his wife focus on valuing and treasuring each other, becoming one flesh, as in Ephesians yeah. 5, 28 through 33. If you read that whole section, Paul is just saying, okay, if you act like Christians, what a transformation it would be. Yeah. You know, as parents to children, as husbands and wives, as in those days, masters and slaves. Okay, go ahead. Be, in, be imitators of God as dear children, Ephesians 5, 1, New King James Version. By God's grace, you are called today to live out that exhortation in your relationships with others. And that's that old Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Okay, so how would a truly Christian marriage look if husbands and wives did as Paul suggested? Well, we believe that Paul was married at one time. A lot of people would be shocked to hear that. Being married was typically required of members of the Sanhedrin. And scholars believe that Paul was at one time a married member of the Sanhedrin since he voted against Stephen in, in Acts. Well, let's just look at that real quick. Acts 8, 1, and Paul, and Paul approved of his murder. Some versions say he voted for, him, for his murder. Um, as we have already studied in Ephesians 6, Paul talked about how the church will eventually be transformed into an army waging peace. He had previously suggested the church is the body of Christ, Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 4, and is God's temple, Ephesians 2, and is the bride, the bride or wife of Christ, Ephesians 5. In Ephesians 6, he, ta he talked about a call to arms, not to wage wa war, but to wage peace. So, I mean, here we have the whole story. <laughs> Paul warned us about the enemy that we face. He knew how difficult the challenge would be, but he focused on the marvelous help that is available to us in Christ and the Holy Spirit. So, think about that. He says, yeah, you're facing a terrible foe. There's no question about that. But what kind of help do you have? Yes. After talking about the various effects that Christianity will have on individuals, we realize that... I'm from the Bible study. Sorry, my fault. Give me just a second. Okay, go ahead. From the Bible study guide. Unity is realized only when we embrace our new identity and walk in Christ. This profound transformation in Christ will also affect all aspects of our human life, including our families, husbands, wives, and children society, people groups, and social classes, and our personal individual lives from the Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Paul realized, and I think he had really comprehended, that the life and death of Jesus had and has a transforming impact on the world as God works through his church. This is something that had not been revealed to people in the Old Testament times, but was revealed in Paul's generation. Paul's transformational experience on the road to Damascus changed him from a bigoted Pharisee, and he was, to a world-traveling evangelist for Jesus Christ, and his special privilege was what? Taking the gospel to Gentiles. Yeah. He placed his life on the line every day to speak of his love and what Jesus has done for all of us. The end is coming. Paul and Ellen White both pointed us forward to a marvelous future with, with God. I guess that's mine, isn't it? All the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed. Unfettered by mortality, and we're talking about the future, of course, they wing their tireless flight to worlds afar, worlds that thrilled with sorrow at the spectacle of human woe and rang with songs of gladness at the tidings of a ransomed soul. The whole world ring with joy at the ransomed soul. Remember Jesus said, more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 just persons that don't need to, at least don't think they need to be <laughs> repentance. 
With unfettered, with unfettered delight, the children of earth enter into the joy and the wisdom of unfallen beings. They share the treasures of knowledge and understanding gained to ages upon ages in contemplation of God's handiwork. With undimmed vision, they gaze upon the glory of creation, suns and stars and systems, all in their appointed order, circling the throne of deity. Upon all things, from the least to the greatest, the Creator's name is written, and in all are the riches of His power displayed. And I, I'm just trying to imagine from a human perspective, but think of the, 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 the new web telescope and all that it can see. God will make it so that we can do, have that kind of vision without any telescope. And think of the, the electron microscopes and all they can see, the little tiny, tiny things. God is going to make it so we can see those things without any microscope. Mm. Just think about it. Mm. With undimmed vision, they gaze upon the glory of creation, suns and stars and systems. Uh, I already read that. And their pointed or uh, all in their appointed order, order, circling the throne of deity. Upon all things, from the least to the greatest, the Creator's name is written, and in all are the riches of His power displayed. And the years of eternity as they roll will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ. I mean, how could it be more glorious than what we already have available to us? And knowledgeable is progressive, so will love, reverence, and happiness increase. The more men learn of God, the greater will be their admiration of His character. I want to read that one more time. The more men learn of God, the greater will be their admiration of His character. As Jesus opens before them the riches of redemption and the amazing achievements in the great controversy with Satan, the hearts of the ransomed thrill with more fervent devotion and with more rapturous joy they sweep the harps of gold and 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of voices unite to swell the mighty chorus of praise. I mean, look at all that we know or we have the privilege of knowing and yet how much more there is to know. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in this sea, are all, of the, all of them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory. And it's time for us to conclude. The great controversy will be ended. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, as we read these marvelous words from that humble lady that she used in recent, in recent times, and all the words that Paul spoke so grandly even from prison. It's hard for us to even wrap our minds around it. Help us to grasp more fully than we ever have before these marvelous truths is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.